Um, so moving on to our patient safety and value panel. Um, uh, I'm Kate Von Dorf. I'll be moderating our panel. I am thrilled to introduce uh, three of my fantastic colleagues. Uh, I could go on all day about them and tell you about the trampoline at Kathy's house and all sorts of awesome <laughs> stories, but I'm going to stick to the script. Safety problem. <laughs> Safety. Yes. <laughs> There's some irony there, yes. Um, okay, and Doug, uh, I believe you all know Doug, and Doug has been introduced. So in the interest of giving everyone more time to talk, I'm going to just say welcome back to the stage, Doug, um, and introducing Kathy. Kathy is the Executive Director of the Center for Health Policy and the Center for Primary Care and Outcomes Research, as well as a senior scholar at the centers. Uh, her research focuses on healthcare quality measures and improvement. Uh, she and her team have developed over 100 ev evidence-based national quality prevention and safety measures. I have been fortunate enough to use some of them in my own work, and she has published seminal reports on patient safety and quality improvement strategies. She has served on two National Academy of Medicine committees, one on child health and healthcare measures, and recently on another improving, on improving diagnosis and diagnostic errors. Um, both have grappled with the difficulty in effectively measuring and improving quality and health. Um, our third speaker will be David Chan. David is a physician and an economist and also a core faculty member at Stanford Health Policy. Uh, his research focuses on productivity in U.S. healthcare and draws on insights from labor and organizational economics. He is particularly interested in studying what drives physician behavior, how this explains differences in productivity in healthcare delivery, and what the implications are for the design of healthcare. He is a recipient of the 2014 NIH Director's High Risk, High Reward Early Independence Award to study the optimal balance of information in health information technology for patient care. He's an investigator at the uh, VA as well as a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. And I'll let you guys take it away, starting with Doug. Thank you so much, Kate. So I'm going to talk a little bit about high-value care. We've just been had a lot of questions about how the healthcare systems are going to provide that. And Bob Kocher and others have alluded to this. This graph shows the um, uh, cost of healthcare insurance premiums going from 1999, 1999 when it cost about not quite $6,000 to insure a family to now when it cost $18,000 uh, for that same insurance. Obviously, that is a dramatic increase. At the time that's happening, take a look at this red line, which shows the median household income in the United States. And so during the period when health insurance premiums doubled or more, uh, median household income stayed relatively flat. To make the matter even somewhat more distressing for individuals paying for insurance, this graph shows um, what's happened in terms of who's paying for these higher insurance premiums. So you see 2006 to 2016, and the dark blue is the employer contribution, and the light blue is the employee contribution. You see that the total premiums have gone up by 58% over, over the last 10 years, but the amount that employees are paying has gone up uh, 80%, so almost doubled in the last 10 years. Uh, these are extraordinary numbers for most uh, Americans whose uh, incomes um, are probably uh, not like uh, the folks in our, the room today. So this raises the question of how can we assess what is high-value health care? And I'm going to use value here in just the way we do often talking about other things, whether the benefits of an intervention justify its costs. And I'm going to ask a related question, and that is, is care affordable? And by that I mean, not is, the, is it efficient, but what's the total expenditure? Can we afford it in total? And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. It's important to remember that cost is not the same as value. And value is important because you can have a high cost intervention that, pr that is indeed high value. You can have low cost interventions that are low value and so the important take home is that you need to assess both the benefits and the cost together to understand the value of a healthcare intervention. So I'm going to give you two examples that we've worked on. The first is the thousand dollar pill. This is treatment for hepatitis C. These pills are indeed a thousand dollars. And this is work that I've done in co uh, collaboration with uh, our colleagues at the VA, including Steve, who's sitting back here. 
Treatment for hepatitis C is um, one of the most remarkable things that's happened in my career. The new drugs have actually completely revolutionized the treatment of hepatitis C. You, it's curable now, which it was not before. Um, at the same time, a treatment course costs sixty to eighty thousand dollars to to uh, for a course of treatment, which will last maybe six weeks. So we wanted to know: Is this good value care? Is it cost effective? And with our colleagues at the VA and Jeremy Goldharbor Fieber, we looked at the cost effectiveness. This is one of the new drugs, Harvoni by Gilead. You've heard this. You've heard Gilead being um, uh, beat up in the press. Turns out um, it costs less than about $20,000 per quality adjusted life year. A quality adjusted life year is a measure of length and quality of life. And in the United States, we talk about things that are efficient or good value being less than 50, maybe even $100,000 per quality adjusted life year. So $20,000 uh, per quality adjusted life year is good value by any of the benchmarks that people have talked about. But at the same time, we also want to ask, is it affordable? There are a lot of people in the United States with hepatitis C, and to treat them all at these current treatment prices would cost $100 billion. The VA has committed to treat every veteran with hepatitis C and is likely to cost $7 to $14 billion for the VA to do that. Um, so this is an example of a treatment that is good value but in aggregate is very, very expensive and, and uh, difficult for many healthcare systems. Let me talk about another example, and this is HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. So that's giving HIV drugs to someone who does not have HIV to help keep them from getting HIV, either through sexual transmission or through um, injection drug use. So we did an analysis. This was led by Cora Bernard. Cora's not here. She's one of our PhD students in management science and engineering, and led by Jeremy Goldharbor Fiebert. Um, and so the, problem, the situation that we wanted to look at is this. The CDC recommends HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis for people who inject drugs. Their currently approved drug is tenofovir and tricitabine. It costs $10,000 a year. Now remember, you're giving this to people who are not sick. They're people who are at risk for getting HIV. And it's one of several interventions. So this is what we found. This graph shows on the y-axis is incremental quality adjusted life years. In thousands, and on the x-axis is incremental costs. You can't really see the, uh, the x-axis, I'm sorry, but it's billions of dollars. And you see at the bottom here, um, you, if you don't give pre-exposure prophylaxis, and up here if you do, um, you give pre-exposure prophylaxis plus screen please people plus give them treatment as the CDC recommends. And we estimated that if you did that for 25% of the people inject drugs, over 20 years it would prevent 27,000 HIV infections. That is a lot of HIV. At the same time, it would cost over $250,000 per quality adjusted life year, which is far above any benchmark that's been proposed either here or elsewhere. And over 20 years to treat 25, to do, to provide pre-exposure prophylaxis for 25% of people inject drugs would be $44 billion. So this is an example of a, of a um, preventive intervention uh, which is recommended by the CDC. It's not good value by conventional standards. Its affordability is quite low. Um, it would be aggregate of very high expenditures. Yet you might decide that you want to do this for social justice reasons, for ethical reasons. These are vulnerable, it's a vulnerable population. So what can we do about this? First, of course, you eliminate interventions that provide no health benefits, such as routine imaging for low back pain. Um, that sounds good, but it's much harder to do in practice, but there's a lot of attention to that now, including at the VA and other places. You can provide interventions that are beneficial and reduce costs, and there are some, and there, we should certainly be doing those. And then for interventions that provide benefit but are more expensive, you assess whether they provide a high value and then try to come to grips with how you're going to provide those. Um, I think the, the two examples illustrate a fundamental challenge and, and that we're going to have to face. These are both really life-saving technologies. Uh, one is good value but very expensive in total. The other is not such good value and very expensive in total. And we really haven't come to grips with how we're going to make decisions about whether we're going to provide these. 
We have countless other examples, and these are the kinds of problems that Chris and uh, David um, are going to have to help, Then that's why Jay's students should all go into health policy. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. Everybody's hanging, hanging with us very well. Um, I'm going to talk about three uh, underappreciated opportunities, um, kind of in the sphere of uh, quality in healthcare. So, you know, from a health policy perspective, we always talk about cost, um, access, and quality. And cost and access are a little easier to measure than quality. And we've been kind of skirting around this quality issue, talking about clinical benefits, but um, kind of what is quality and how can we um, be able to improve it. Um, it's too too big a topic to even do a good biopsy on. So I, I'm going to focus on sort of three, three things that I think are levers um, for the future. So the first is a federal agency. Um, this is an agency that's funded a lot of my research, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. I'm curious how many people know about it. Half, half. Um, it's a small agency. The budget's about 300 to 400 million a year. Um, by comparison, NIH is 30 billion and our healthcare spending is a trillion from the federal government. So this is a very, very tiny budget. If you look at HHS and you look at all the agencies, it's really the smallest. Um, but it has a systems focus. Um, and in its name, it has the word quality. Um, the new uh, director of the agency, Andy Beinman, comes from UCSF. He's a primary care physician. And he was interviewed recently by JAMA, and it's a great article. Um, and what he points out is that uh, one of the pressing issues that this small agency is in a good position to work on is healthcare safety. And they've been working on that issue for years. Um, they have uh, federal allocations of about 60 million, 70 million a year for patient safety. And he also highlights um, that in addition to the successes that have occurred in patient safety and part of the quality sphere um, in terms of reducing health acquired infections, um, and other health-acquired conditions, that there's a new kind of underappreciated kit on the block, um, and that's diagnostic safety and the quality of diagnosis. And this small agency just had a, a great um, summit on this issue uh, last month. I was fortunate enough to get to talk about sort of organiza organizational factors that shape um, how diagnosis is done. Um, but what is, what is diagnostic safety and what is diagnostic error? Uh, a National Academy of Medicine uh, committee uh, has defined diagnostic error as the failure to establish an accurate and timely explanation of the patient's health problems or communicate that explanation to the patient. Um, so this is a very patient-centered definition. And what the committee also said was that uh, they tried to scale what the problem was, that basically everyone Virtually everyone will experience a diagnostic error in their lifetime, sometimes with serious consequences. Um, and if you really think of diagnosis in the sort of broad uh, picture of all of the opportunities to be diagnosed, it's not so, you know, it's not so surprising that there would be moments where there would be delays that could be consequential or where there could be misses or, or, or wrong diagnoses. Um, but when patients go to the healthcare system, they kind of expect that they'll be able to be diagnosed, and then once there's a diagnosis, that's where everything, you know, that's, that's where the entire system organizes around the treatment and continuing. Um, so this is an area that, that uh, deserves more attention, and this committee um, pointed that out. Um, it's, it's a challenging area, it's a bit touchy, there's a lot of professional pride um, around diagnosis, and so to get more of a systems approach uh, to, to being able to tackle it is, um, is the next step. In terms of thinking about diagnostic safety and, and uh, diagnostic error, um, there's different sources of data uh, on what the common conditions are that can be misdiagnosed. Um, and basically, the common, uh, commonly misdiagnosed conditions are common conditions because they happen, <laughs> they're prevalent, and so that's uh, where you're going to get the misses. And that's, that's a little non-intuitive. I mean, sometimes you think the, the hard diagnostic stuff would be the rare, you know, or the very tricky diagnosis, but actually, um, there's a reasonable frequency of diagnostic mishaps in common um, diagnoses. To get any traction in any area of safety or quality, we need measurements. This is the sort of third underappreciated um, opportunity. Measurement is information. Um, it's clues. And just like the game of, of clue, um, if you put the right 
you know, bits of information together, you're going to win the game. And if you don't put the right pieces of information together, you're not going to win the game. Um, from a serious point of view, though, in healthcare, uh, as you think about measuring and being able to get at measures that are, are more challenging um, to, to understand that aren't so quantifiable, um, you have to think about what purpose you're measuring. Uh, because, because measurement will always have error. Measurement is never perfect. That's the nature of measurement. Uh, so it's a question of what are you trying to measure for? Um, and in all of our development work, that's where we start when we're developing measures, is, is how will this measure be used? Kate mentioned uh, using some of the measures that our group have worked on in, in research, I assume. Uh, so that's one, one common use of measures. Another is to scale a problem. So like diagnostic error, how, how big is the problem? Where is the problem? Uh, improving uh, care. So in improvement efforts as a tool to aid in improvement. Measures over, over the time that I've been involved in measurement have um, been used more and more for, uh, for more external reasons. So transparency, consumer choice, um, and now pay for performance. Uh, so the idea that, that you could look at this, this quality construct in a way that would allow you to incentivize quality means you have to think about measuring it so that the, the signal you're getting in terms of quality is, is reliable enough for that kind of measurement purpose. Um, ultimately, uh, that means we need a much bigger investment, in my opinion, in being able to develop measures. And there was recently a, a pre-publication uh, vital signs uh, report that Bob Kocher was involved in, um, in, in authoring, as well as uh, some other big measurement experts in terms of kind of needing more standards and more investment in measurement in the healthcare field. And I think all of the talks before this have shown um, how important that's gonna be. And it's not, it's not a small thing to try to develop measures in a very rigorous way to have them be feasible and to have them be useful. And I would just um, wrap up by saying that um, in many cases, uh, what we wanna measure in terms of quality and safety is hard to measure. Uh, and, and so for example, for this area of diagnostic safety and, and diagnostic improvement, uh, there's an article that a couple of my colleagues who were on this National Academy um, Committee uh, wrote about in terms of needing kind of all the stakeholders involved uh, it, who are, who are going to be, who their, their work is going to be reflected in the measure. You need all of them. So from patients to hospitals to outpatient, et cetera, you need everybody um, in the mix to uh, tackle this measurement problem, an all-in approach. So just a few things to think about. Um, in the future of healthcare. Thank you. I know it's tricky. I'll go behind your chair. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I'm really happy to be part of this distinguished committee, uh, you know, talking about <laughs> safety and value, uh, health policy through uh, 2020. Um, and so I'm going to kind of frame or reframe the question kind of in a way that many economists would view this, uh, you know, in terms of productivity or efficiency. So a lot of these things are related. A lot of these concepts that we've been talking about, quality, value, safety, they kind of get at this general idea of for the money that we're spending, what are we getting from it? Or equivalently, for a certain kind of level of health that we would like to shoot for, are we spending too much? relative to other places um, or kind of situations to kind of produce this healthcare. Um, and so there are kind of really two uh, questions related to this. One is that, you know, let's just fix the amount of money that we're spending. Can we kind of maximize the health that we're getting? And then the second one, which is perhaps more difficult and gets at Doug's kind of question about affordability, is where do we want to kind of locate on the overall spending? Say, say that we're completely efficient in producing health for the money that we're spending, how much money should we spend? Now, there, I'm not sure if there are any macroeconomists in the audience, but like a couple famous macroeconomists at Stanford actually say we should be spending a third of our national kind of GDP on, on healthcare, uh, given the improvements in technology. If we're getting kind of improvements uh, in health, um, what's not to say that it's not worth spending uh, money on that? So why uh, is it that we think that value is an important concept in healthcare as opposed to other kind of industries where we spend money and get stuff? Uh, and there have been kind of, I'm just gonna go through some really stylized facts that we could spend a lot more time talking about, 
But one is that, you know, um, if we compare the care that we get today with the care that we used to get in the 1960s, true, we're spending much more today than in the 1960s, but we're getting so much more. Uh, David Cutler has kind of worked through a couple of really famous examples of, you know, the care for heart attacks or the care for uh, neonates. Uh, it used to be, you know, when President Eisenhower had a heart attack in 1955, uh, all they could do for him was put him in a quiet room. And this was the President of the United States and the stock market plunged by, you know, uh, you know, more than the Great Recession, but there was nothing that we could do about it. So in that sense, you know, we are getting something for the money that we're spending. We are getting value. Um, but then another kind of fact to kind of consider is this cross-national variation. Uh, how much is America spending relative to other countries? How much are we getting from that? As well as cross kind of within small area, cross small area variation, the famous Dartmouth, Dartmouth Atlas, uh, where you know we have McAllen, Texas versus El Paso, Texas, or Miami, uh, and you know we see that some areas are spending much more and not getting very much for the money that they're spending. And then, kind of more recently, so not talking about 1960s versus today, over the last 15 to 20 years, you know we've seen kind of a stagnation in the productivity growth in healthcare. So whereas retail and manufacturing and technology have seen increases in productivity about 4% per year, healthcare has had a pretty much a 0% increase in productivity in terms of the amount of money that we're spending and some kind of rough measure of how much we're getting from that money that we're spending. So the, the, you know, these are causes to kind of really kind of you know, study this carefully and these could be really important for how we uh, think about delivering healthcare. So this is just a, you know, a map of one of maybe a hundred different maps you could just get from Dartmouth, the, the Dartmouth Atlas, which is just so, showing that there's a lot of variation across the U.S. Uh, in small areas uh, in terms of how much people spend, in terms of the outcomes that you get. And there's very little correlation between these two. And so I could show you another graph. This is just the percentage of patients readmitted within 30 days of discharge. They have hundreds of these graphs, uh, of, of these maps, and they all kind of, sh you know, they, they, they're in not recognizable patterns because, because there's very little correlation. Then more recently, there have been research that has kind of looked at non-Medicare spending, and surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, that kind of variation is not related to the variation that we see in Medicare spending. Um, and, you know, just taking, if you kind of zoom in with a magnifying glass and within these small areas, you'll actually find within small areas, the hospital that's across the street from another hospital can have big differences in how much that hospital, these two hospitals spend and the outcomes that they get. And then if you zoom even further within a hospital, if you're randomly assigned to different doctors, you can see that being assigned to one doctor versus another can entail as much of a twofold difference in spending. So. You know, Bob Kocher's, you know, the, the whole market power of doubling prices by, by twice, you could just get that randomly by going to the hospital and getting Dr. A versus Dr. B. So there's a lot that we don't know in terms of how to actually, do, you know, what's the optimal level of care. And, you know, this kind of gets at the heart of why healthcare is difficult, which is um, there's a lot of kind of information that, um, that, that is not transparent or that is not known even by doctors. Um, so again, why is healthcare different? And I think this could pretty much be boiled down into two kind of main um, features. One is that it's difficult to observe quality um, or to attribute outcomes. So we might see mortality, but as you know, as was mentioned in the very beginning, mortality is not purely a function of healthcare. Uh, mortality is a function of many other things. And so you know, to attribute healthcare delivery. Um, on certain outcomes, that's a non-trivial task, and that's at the heart of determining if we're getting value for the heart for the healthcare that we're having. And then the second, which you know I think is super important, and you know I was glad to hear Bob uh, and Jay talk about this, is that you know if, historically in the U.S. we've had a payment environment that doesn't really incentivize quality. So in a fee-for-service environment uh, that you know purely pays people for how much care they're giving. Um, that, that seems kind of orthogonal to the quality of care that you get. Yet there's also research that shows that healthcare might not be that different. You know, so you've got cement industry, which in some ways is similar to healthcare. So we, ha we have people traveling you know, within five miles to you know, see a doctor. We don't want to go much farther. Same thing with cement. If you travel more than five miles, it's going to dry up. So we see <laughs> there's, a, there's, you know, there's a huge variation in productivity in cement and airline catering, and these are just industries that people have looked at. They're very homogeneous industries. So this problem of you know, productivity variation is not unique to healthcare, and I think it might be kind of 
cause for inspiration uh, to look at other industries to figure out what, what we can learn uh, in changing healthcare. And then finally, you know, we've been talking about relatively macro things, but the real difficulty, I think, is how do you, so suppose you have an incentive system for the hospital to improve quality. How does that hospital get its doctors uh, to kind of make the right decisions when it's hardly agreed upon what the right decision is across doctors? Uh, and, you know, you might think you might have a system of checklists or, you know, a highly complex system of what to do for a given patient. But the fact is, a lot of this stuff we just don't know, and discretion plays a high role in, in healthcare. So, you know, similar to Nordstrom, the Nordstrom rule, the employee kind of uh, orientation packet was one page that said, rule number one, use good judgment in all situations. There will be no additional rules. So, and, to, <laughs> and to some extent, I mean, that's kind of the rules that we have in academia. It's like, just be excellent. But, <laughs> you know, it's, it's also- Really true. excellent. <laughs> It's also true in medicine where it's hard to describe ex ante what to do for that particular patient in front of you. So with that, I'm, I'm probably just going to end um, with just a few big policy questions. And I'm going to start with, I'm going to end with more questions than I've answered, obviously. But, you know, people have talked about the role of incentives uh, as kind of a, a you know, a cure-all. But, you know, this is kind of, you know, there's really old, you know, uh, literature about the folly of, of paying for A while hoping for B. And so we're trying to measure these things, but to some extent, it's really difficult to measure the things that we want to incentivize. Also, the trade-off between coordination and competition, which Lauren has talked about, you know, with market power as a potential side effect of having better coordination. And then, um, you know, there might be low-lying fruits of kind of improving the product production process by getting rid of paperwork, like the average physician spends 140 hours a, a year on paperwork. Um, and, you know, we can get rid of that, but some of the bigger, more difficult questions is how do we foster organizational change? So with that, thank you very much.